11.25 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, Tuesday, August 25th, 1981, the Voyager 2 spacecraft passed within 63,000 miles of Saturn, enabling scientists a billion miles away on Earth to look, to listen, to learn much, much more about deep space than has ever been possible in the past. One week later, a scientist embarked on what would be for him a familiar deep dive into the icy, eerie waters of the Arctic Ocean. In another ocean, in another world really, are the Hawaiian Islands. Here, the American Institute of Architects will hold its 1982 National Convention, celebrating the AIA's 125th anniversary and a quest in time. The distant depths of space and sea will not be far from anyone's mind in Hawaii come June 1982, because it's clear that both space and sea will have an important place in the future, and probably the not too distant future for architects. Architects can have a, a role in the development of life in space uh, in a surprisingly early time frame. The, uh, Gerard O'Neill is a professor of physics at Princeton University and author of the new book, 2081. He is also president of the Space Studies Institute, a nonprofit foundation supporting space research in the private sector. And he will be one of the three featured seminar speakers at the 1982 AIA National Convention. Habitation in space is not going to be the kind of big, beautiful, island one space colonies that I wrote about in The High Frontier. You don't build the... Uh, Dr. Gentry Lee, space NASA physicist and mission operations manager for the Viking Project, man's first close encounter with Mars, another speaker at the 1982 AIA convention. ...is that it is extremely likely that a large number of people will figure out sometime in the next 20 years that there are things that can be made in space much cheaper, including everything, than they can be made on the Earth, or much better, either one, and that when you put those two things together, there will become an economic reason for being in space. So people will build structures in space in order to make things in space. The next thing that will happen is... I've, and I'm intrigued with it because I've never really thought about architects and the ocean. But obviously, um, there's a place, isn't there? Joseph McInnes, physician. The man responsible for Canada's first underwater manned station. The first man to dive beneath the polar ice cap. Head of Undersea Research Limited, independent consultants. And our other speaker. Because what has always intrigued me, and I know some of the astronauts, is that some of the problems are common. If you step off the planet to go into the water or into space, you're dealing with essentially the same difficulties. You have to take the environment with you. To take your food, your shelter, all of those things that you're used to and take for granted on land have to go with you. So I'm going to learn a lot from these individuals who are going to talk about space and from the architects. Hawaii may seem a strange setting for such serious explorations. There is a certain sense of timelessness in its rugged coastlines, its majestic vistas, its lush vegetation, its apparent isolation thousands of miles from any major landfall. And yet, largely because of modern transportation and modern communications, Hawaii shares many of the problems and pressures of modern society. The same problems and pressures that are pushing us to look seriously toward the new frontiers of space and the sea. Hawaii is a kind of microcosm of spaceship Earth. Indeed, Hawaii has its own modern day pioneers in geothermal energy, wind power, aquaculture, and sea-based planning for the year 2000 and beyond not to mention energetic efforts to find its own architectural identity. An island paradise? Yes. But also an appropriate place to look toward the future as part of AIA's quest in time, surrounded by space and the sea. It is said that men climb mountains just because they are there. But the reasons for jumping off the earth into the depths of space or the sea will have to be more practical than that. Gerard O'Neill. We, we feel that um, for the breakout uh, into the high frontier to occur at all, uh, it's got to happen in such a cost-effective way that it can be done for an investment cost that's within the range of private capital. Joe McInnes. The difficulty is, of course, there has to be 
uh, a drawing card. There has to be something that makes it economically viable or so scientifically important that it can be justified because it's expensive as hell. It is really expensive. You put a man off the shore and into the water even for a short period of time, uh, it costs a lot of money. We'll be Gentry Lee. economic. We will go into space because it pays to be in space. We will live in space because it pays to live in space. Energy out there will be unlimited in the form of direct and uninterrupted solar power, ours for the taking. The first structures are likely to be prefabs. The, the natural prefab that we've got is the shuttle external tanks. Every time the shuttle goes up into orbit, it carries along with it the external fuel tank, which is bigger than the shuttle orbiter itself. And that fuel tank, even when empty, weighs more than the whole payload of the shuttle. It's a huge thing, bigger than Skylab. And what we will be doing uh, is to use those surplus empty fuel shells in orbit, tying them together with steel cables, letting them rotate around each other to provide Earth normal gravity, and uh, linking them together with various passageways. There will be a need for architects even under these circumstances, perhaps especially under these circumstances, to provide a kind of cultural continuity. Uh, there's a lot of room for architectural design in that case. It's a, it's a harshly uh, austere kind of design because you're living within uh, very precise requirements. But of course, as has often been known, uh, some of the greatest creativity in the architectural field and other creative fields comes when you impose a tight set of constraints and then let imagination go within those constraints. Later, but probably not much later, materials will come from the moon and from the asteroids at a fraction of the cost of getting them from Earth. Now, the lunar materials we know about in great detail as the result of the Apollo program. Typical unselected shovel full of lunar soil is about 14% aluminum by weight, several percent of iron, about 20% silicon, uh, in several areas as much as 4% titanium. And overall, throughout all of the lunar surface, you have about 40% oxygen, which you need, of course, for water or for breathing or for propellants, for rockets. So the material is there, and it's the right stuff, and we want to bring it out and make use of it to build uh, our large colonies and our other structures and to build them what, with what will really be rather conventional terrestrial-like building materials. There, the, uh, the excitement is going to be in part the unusual geometry working on the interior of a rotating sphere, and second, the tremendous challenge and the tremendous opportunity of working with different levels of gravity because although the, the architecture of the region near the equator is going to be not that different from the architecture of the Earth, by the time you get up close to the rotational axis of the colony, gravity will fall off to almost nothing, and it will be possible to design very light, airy structures which can yet support the very small loads that they'll be required to take. So a beautifully new and airy and fantastic kind of architecture will become possible there, extremely beautiful if done properly, that will never be possible on the surface of the Earth. Every single architect that does anything in space will also have to be a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, have to know something about the computer because uh, what kind of structures will be able to be built will be those that can be essentially put together in a, a logical format and implemented by a computer-driven teleoperator. And what of the other new frontier, the sea? And I've always felt that, that we should be designing ourselves more and more into the sea, that we should be taking advantage uh, of the fact that the land does continue beyond the shoreline, that you can actually march down into it. And we could use certain kinds of those waters for certain kinds of functions. This, to me, the exciting thing is that Unlike space, which I'm very excited about and has its own qualities of inspiration, is uh, it's inaccessible to us. But the ocean, I don't think there's any one of us that isn't in some way affected by the ocean. We either like it or are afraid of it or are inspired by it. And it's this last quality that I'm fascinated with, that, that the ocean offers uh, uh, an aesthetics. It offers... Uh, a kind of a, and always has, to poets, to writers, to artists. And so certainly it would to architects who would come down to the edge of the sea and who would look out 
and maybe, for example, envision an airport offshore. Prototype structures have already been built, and people have used them to stay underwater for as long as a month at a time at depths of up to a thousand feet, sometimes deeper. They call them sea lab, they call them tektite concha. Those have been built, and that's what I was involved in very much in the 60s and 70s. So now we know that it's possible to live underneath the ocean, and we know the physiological costs, which are minimal. And we're at the threshold now of the implications, where we can take the basic rudimentary designs that have, have evolved, the teardrop shape of the submarine, the spherical shape of the station, and change them into designs for the future. I, I think this is one of the things that, that we suffer from, is there are not enough really good artistic architectural designs coming. They've all been given over to the engineers. Well, we've passed that stage now. Indeed, we have reached the stage where man can work, fish, and farm underwater, where fully one-third of our oil and gas can be expected to come from offshore sources, where it's feasible to build out and down instead of up. The continental shelf, this huge 11 and a half million square miles of the shoulders of the coastline, which has just opened up in the last two decades. And now, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to continue the old pillage and rape and the old way of looking at things, or are we going to take our design on the future? And certainly architects would have to be in, in the forefront of this. Are we going to design our way into the ocean's future? Are we going to build offshore platforms that are functional and aesthetic? Are we going to build offshore airports and sea ranches? I don't know, but I think that uh, this is a question that an architect would have to ask himself. Is it in his future, or is it in the generations to come? Certainly, uh, the pressures are there. That we've used up the land, we have to look to the ocean in a different way than we have in the past. August 26, 1981. A front page newspaper article begins, the Voyager 2 spacecraft sped toward a place in history as much as toward a point in space. Toward a place in history. What place in history? We, you and I, are the only people who will ever have the privilege of saying we explored the solar system first. So architects have got their chance in a very early time frame. Whether they do that job well or badly will have an enormous effect on the effectiveness of the people that are working in space. And this is the great joy of the sea, is that you cannot be linear in your thinking. You have to think as mariner, as sailor, as meteorologist, as diver, you have to think in all kinds of frames. I include art and science together and even music and poetry because I don't think these should be separated. Um, because out of them comes the wellspring of creativity, which is what we're really after, isn't it? In a decade, or by the year 2000, or even a hundred years from now, Will every architect be designing space colonies or undersea habitats? Of course not. But some will. And for their very survival, most will be forced to consider what Gerard O'Neill calls the drivers of change. In addition to space colonies, computers, automation, communications, and the critical link, energy. The 1982 National Convention, marking the 125th anniversary of the American Institute of Architects, will be a forum for Gerard O'Neill, Gentry Lee, Joe McInnes, and for every architect there who wants to explore with these thought leaders the implications of inevitable and impending changes. Changes already happening. Changes that, to some extent, are even now beginning to affect the way every architect on Earth practices. That will be discussed, too, in Hawaii.